My name is uh, Kevin Connor. I'm an engineering manager with uh, Red Hat, and I'm responsible for the Istio team on the engineering side, or the middleware engineering side. So I've been with Red Hat for a very long time. I came across with the JBoss acquisition and went through transactions and so on, and uh, eventually ended up with uh, Istio. So one of the things that we're seeing, one of the trends we're seeing these days is a, uh, transla a transition from transition from deploying uh, big monolithic applications over to microservices environment. So we're starting to break apart applications, and there are various reasons that we do this. It may well be that we want to isolate one part of an application from another. So if there's a, a problem with one part, then it doesn't impact the others. It may well be that we want to scale different parts of the application in different ways. Or we could have different development teams, and we want to give them different uh, deployment life cycles for uh, developing, testing, and deploying their applications into production. None of this, however, is new. We've been talking about distributed computing for a very long time. And all the issues that we've already identified with distributed computing are equally as valid with microservices, especially when the, you look at the network, uh, especially when you consider all the issues with networking. So distributed architectures tend to get very messy. We've got nine services there. And already you can see that there's a potential for a lot of intercommunication between the services. But when you scale that up to 1,000 services or 10,000 services, then everything just gets lost in the mess. Mesh. Sorry, mess. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, so that's where the tooling comes into play, and that's where things like service mesh comes into play. But there are a number of fallacies that we already know through distributed computing which are equally applicable equally applicable to microservices. So uh, a reliance on a reliable network. I mean, obviously, networks are not reliable. They drop out. We get uh, routers that will go down. We get cabling that goes down. We lose packets. So we need to be able to, to deal with that, not only in distributed computing, but also in microservices as well. Uh, there's a latency, in, latency involved in communication. It's not free. It takes time to send packets via routers or whatever it is to your other service. Your bandwidth is limited. There's a certain amount of information that you can send between services, and you need to bear that in mind so that you don't swamp the uh, service that you're invoking. Uh, security on the network. If you have access to the network, either because you've got access to one of the machines or the hardware, then you can obviously intercept the traffic. You can modify the traffic. You can uh, prevent packets from getting to their destination. So there's a lot you can do there. Uh, topology changes. IP is designed to adapt when network changes. So if a router goes down, your packets get rerouted around other routes. So uh, you end up potentially getting more latency in your services and your invocations as well. Multiple administrators, no one administrator uh, will look after a, a network in your organization. There'll be a whole group of them, and they'll have different responsibilities for different, uh, different areas of it. Uh, we're also costs to uh, to invoke services, so you need to be careful with what you're doing there. And you have uh, multiple different types of services and languages, platforms, etc., that you have to consider when you're uh, working in a distributed com computing environment. So how do we deal with the complexity of this? How is it that with the distributed computing or with microservices, what are the things that we need to do to try and deal with that? First, service discovery. We need to be able to remove any kind of dependency on location for a service that we're invoking. If somebody elsewhere who controls another service decides they're moving it to another IP address, you want your service still to be able to invoke it. You don't want to have to hard code your IP address into the this, this service. Uh, retries, if there are failures in communicating with services, you want to be able to retry it, because you've got to tolerate the failure on the network. Uh, similar with timeouts, if you make an invocation to a service and it takes too long, then you want to, to time out and you want to take uh, another course of action to try and compensate for that. Circuit breaking, if you have a service which is prone to failure, you recognize that it's failing a lot, then you want the circuit breaker to fire, you want it to be open, and at that point, you no longer want to send traffic to that service, you want to take, take some other compensation action and uh, deal with it in a different way. Uh, limiting, similar, you don't want to swamp the, the service that you're 
uh, invoking, so you want to control how much information is going there. And load balancing, you want to distribute your request across multiple instances of a service so that you spread the load, you can scale it up and uh, increase the throughput that you're getting for your services. Uh, bulk heading, if you have requests that are blocking, you want that to be taken out and handled separately from your main application. You don't want to be handling that within your main application. Uh, there's a whole load of these, edge routing, DMZ routing, uh, doing per request routing, so based on headers or identity or some other attribute of the request that's going through. A-B testing, traffic shaping, doing a, a dark launch, so you, you want to put your uh, new versions into production, but you don't want people to access it, you want certain people to access it. Uh, shadowing traffic, being able to take live traffic from a service and duplicate it to a, excuse me, to another service that you're testing, but without it impacting the, the live service. And uh, injecting faults for uh, being able to test your application so that you can see how it tolerates failures to do with the network or, or the services failing as well. Uh, zone aware load balancing, health checks, stats, telemetry, logging, distributed tracing, and of course security, which is the big one that you should be concerned about. So what do distribu distributed systems tend to need? If you're starting from a distributed computing perspective, then you have your application, and it will pull in lots of third-party libraries to, uh, to fulfill some of those re uh, requirements that you have. So if I can zoom in. So you'll have, for example, something which can manage the configuration of your service, something that can manage the discovery, the routing behavior, circuit rating, tracing, whatever it happens to be. So those all get uh, pulled into your application. They're compiled into your application. It doesn't matter whether that's Java, C++, whatever your language is. You need to have some kind of way of dealing with that, uh, dealing with fa failures, and it tends to be through third-party libraries. Netflix, is, uh, Netflix OSS have a lot which... Uh, they're popular in the Java side. If you're using other languages, they have alternatives as well. There is, however, a problem to this, which is when it comes to maintenance, it really is a nightmare because all these capabilities that you're building into your application are now tightly coupled with your application. So if you have applications which are written in different languages or they're using different frameworks, then you start to see incompatibility issues between them, when you're, especially when you're looking at like thousands or tens of thousands of services. If you have an existing application, then it's very likely that these frameworks will force you to redesign your application in some way to refactor it so that you can embed their framework into your application and take advantage of their features. And when it comes to upgrades, you now have the challenge of trying to upgrade this across all the services that are in, the micro, in your uh, mesh, service mesh, uh, sorry, the distributed application at the same time. So that means that if you're introducing something, perhaps because of a CVE, then you need to make sure that the other applications you're talking to, if it's changed the behavior of the application in any way, then they can tolerate it. And they also have the same fix within their libraries as well. So there should be a better way. And of course, there is a better way. And that's why we're here today. We're here to talk about Istio. So just before I go on and talk about that, can I just ask how many people actually have knowledge of service mesh in any way? Okay, and of those, how many know Istio? And how many have used Istio? Okay, I'd hoped there were going to be more than that, actually. <laughs> I think I counted five hands there. All right, that's a surprise. I thought it was going to be more. Okay, so you guys may know some of this, especially if you're connected with Red Hat in any way, but the, the obvious starting place is you can do distributed services with Kubernetes. <laughs> Kubernetes will provide a fair bit of the features that we've talked about before, so deployment resiliency, uh, elasticity for invocations, config management, resource management, et cetera. So that's one option that you have for uh, doing distributed services and fulfilling some of the, the infrastructural requirements of it. OpenShift is obviously another one, which is an extension of Kubernetes and provides additional feature sets. So again, we can zoom in. So you've got logs, monitoring, release management, load balancing, et cetera there. And of course, the one that we've come to talk about today, which is the Istio service mesh, which uh, in our implementation sits on top of OpenShift, in the upstream community sits on top of Kubernetes. But it provides, I'm trying to do this, load balancing, fault tolerance, traceability, observability, service security, chaos engineering, so injecting faults, 
uh, traffic shaping, et cetera, uh, with, along with a number of other facilities as well. Okay, so that's what we're here to talk about. The way that Istio works is Istio takes advantage of a proxy, and that proxy is Envoy, or it's actually an extension of Envoy. We add a number of uh, additional capabilities into the Istio proxy, which are not present in Envoy, uh, to handle some of the features that we want from Istio. Envoy itself can handle level three, level four, level seven traffic. We've got HTTP, HTTP2, gRPC there. Uh, there are other protocols coming in at level seven, so Kafka is one of the ones which is underway at the moment. They're, they're developing that in the, in the Envoy community. And it will handle service discovery, load balancing, basically most of the stuff that we've already just de discussed and said were desirable for a distributed application. It's written in C++, so it's fast. It's got a small footprint. And uh, it can be configured dynamically, so there's no need to restart the proxy if your mesh configuration changes. You just send the updates to the uh, Envoy proxy, it reconfigures itself, and then off you go. Uh, there's actually work underway at the moment between uh, ourselves on the Red Hat side and Google to implement something called incremental XDS, which is a capability for Envoy to just take incremental changes from the control plane. So you no longer have to send all information. So this is getting uh, leaner, faster, much smaller footprint with, uh, with all the changes that we do going into the proxy itself. So the proxy is deployed into your environment uh, as part of your pod. It's deployed as a sidecar. So the, uh, the unit of deployment within Kubernetes, and therefore OpenShift as well, is the pod. And that consists of any number of containers. And they all share the same life cycle. So if you scale up the number of pods, then every time you get a new pod, you get a new copy of all the containers that are in it. If you were to tear down some of the pods, then all the containers disappear as well. So they, they're created at the same time, they disappear at the same time. They also share the same network. So to all intents and purposes, the containers make it appear as if they're running on the same box. Okay, so they've got access to the same IP interfaces, they can send traffic, and in the Istio case, more importantly, they can intercept traffic. So everything which is coming into the pod goes into the proxy, then goes to the, the application. Everything which is going out comes from the application via the proxy into the outside world. So the uh, proxy sidecar can then intercept the traffic and it can handle all the uh, infrastructure capabilities that we're talking about with uh, Istio. So this is really what Istio gives us. Resiliency for handling service uh, failures. We can recover from that. We can handle it transparently. Observability, so we can take a look at uh, metrics. We can look at, use uh, Kiali, which we'll show you later on, to see the uh, visualization of the service mesh. Uh, you can look at uh, Jaeger to get uh, tracing information and try and understand how particular requests are uh, passing through your system. Uh, traffic control, so you can uh, redirect traffic from one instance of a service to another, depending on uh, certain criteria. It could be something which is specific to a request. It could be general. It could be percentage-based. We'll show some of that uh, later on. Uh, security, you can secure the, the network layer so that it's encrypted, and it means if anybody does intercept it, they can't change it because of the encryption. They can't read it because it's encrypted. And when you get the communication between the services, you can verify both ends of the communication so you know who you're talking to as well. Uh, policy enforcement, that could be role-based access control, as simple as saying only service A is allowed to invoke service B, no other service can do that. Or it could be something much more complicated, maybe you've got API management or something in there as well. And the chaos testing is means to inject failures into the path of your, the data path of your application so that you can test to see whether your application is resilient. So those are the main features that Istio gives you. This is a, a kind of a high level overview of Istio itself. So we have, it's split into two different areas. We've got the, the data plane, which is uh, communication service A comes down to proxy there. It goes across to the other proxy up to B, and then B invokes service C. So that's your data plane. That's all, uh, that's what your application is doing, okay? That's all the invocations that your application is making service to service. 
We've also got a control plane at the bottom there. And we've got on here, pilot, we've got the telemetry and policy, and we've got Citadel. So those are the main components. There are some other components as well, but for the, the kind of day-to-day -day use, the, these are the main ones. Citadel is responsible for giving each of your applications, or more specifically, each of the service accounts that's running your applications, a unique identity. It creates a, a key for that identity, and then that identity is used for NTLS so that you can verify uh, the identity on both ends of the uh, communication. A pilot is responsible for tracking changes within the service mesh con configuration. So it talks to a component called Galley, which it handles all the Kubernetes stuff. Uh, when pilot is told about updates to configuration, it pushes all the changes out to the, the Istio proxies. So that ensures that the Istio proxies are kept consistent. They have the same view of the service mesh. It doesn't matter uh, whether you're in one namespace or another namespace. Uh, the pilot is sending the information to them all. And the telemetry and policy is there to handle uh, metrics and policy enforcement. So part of that is out of the data path. Part of it is in the data path. It depends what you're what you do. So this is the ecosystem as it currently stands for Istio Service Mesh. You've got kind of Istio in the middle there, and we, we take advantage of other projects as well, like Jaeger to, to do the, the tracing. You've got Kiali to do the visualization on the service mesh and understand how your services are communicating. And then Prometheus and Grafana to deal with metrics and alerts and the like from uh, your services. OK, so that was a high level quick overview of what Istio is. Uh, I'm going to go through some of the other capabilities and do some demos and the like, but before we do that, does anybody have any questions on any of that? What a question. Uh, can you slide before what is you should pod is in another namespace? If the, sorry, you said in the slide before what happens if the pod is in the other namespace? So there are three pods, but yep. they assume they are all in the same namespace. Kubernetes are open shift. What happens if the pod so, is in another namespace? It doesn't assume that they're in the same namespace. What it assumes is that the name, you have a flat network on the namespaces. So if the namespaces are linked, they can communicate to each other. And the reason that's important is when you are invoking a service, uh, the Istio proxy is actually talking to the pods themselves. So it goes to the pod IP addresses. It doesn't use the virtualized IP address. So it needs to have network visi visibility of what would otherwise be a private IP address to that namespace. Uh, at the moment, with the tech preview we have, or upstream, it can't be used. So the intention for GA is that we will have uh, a service which will then make sure that those namespaces are linked together. So it will automatically join the, the namespaces. So it, it will create your flat namespace uh, for those particular, uh, sorry, flat network for those particular namespaces. And uh, the, the approach that we're taking for GA is also soft multi-tenancy as well, rather than hard multi-tenancy. So we will have multiple, potentially multiple control planes deployed into an instance of OpenShift Kubernetes. And each of those will control a separate subset of namespaces. So they'll have visibility of those namespaces, but not the other ones. And the same with the other control planes as well. So there'll be replicated copies of uh, Jaeger, Kiali, Elasticsearch, et cetera, or the, within each of the control planes as well. OK, any other questions on any of that? Do I need to run uh, Istio as a cluster administrator? Do you need to run Istio as a cluster administrator? <laughs> uh, at the moment, yes, but very soon, no. <laughs> so one of the guys on my team has been working really hard to get rid of that. Uh, the, one of, the, one of the challenges we have at the moment is configuring IP tables. And there was an effort done uh, upstream in the community to replace the, uh, the init container that we currently use in the sidecar with a CNI plugin. So that gets rid of one of the big headaches. Okay? You no, long, no longer need to manipulate IP tables within the application namespace that's done outside of that. There are other things as well. So at the moment on OpenShift, we require privilege access to do the IP tables manipulation and a couple of other things, and we require uh, any UID SEC as well. And those are also being one by one taken, taken care of. So when we get to, to GA, well, actually, probably this sprint or the next sprint rather than GA, it, you will just be able to deploy an application as a normal user, and then it will just work. So we're close. We're not quite there, but we're close. But it's, it's getting close. 
Any other questions on that? Right, let's get on with the fun then. Okay, let's start with observability. So I should have, if everything is working nicely. Okay, so that is book in full. And we've got Istio there as well. So, okay, so what I'm going to do, right, we're going to, first of all, we're going to take a look at uh, monitoring. So we're going to look at Grafana and Prometheus. So I'll get the application up and we'll put some requests through it and then we can take a look and we can see just what's going on on the Grafana side. So you can see Grafana in action. You can see the, uh, the metrics being captured. So what I'm going to do, oops, I'm just going to put some load on book info first and, and then open Grafana. Okay, I shouldn't have done that. There we go. Okay, that's better. So if we go to that's the workload dashboard, so we can choose big book info, choose product page, which is the first service that we'll see. And I'll change this to every five seconds. And then we can start to see uh, traffic coming in, metrics coming into the system. So there, there are quite a few uh, metrics that you have already within uh, Grafana itself, but obviously you can create your own based on the information that's being captured. And not only that, but you can set alerts based on the metrics as well. So if you have a certain threshold that you want to be notified, say the failure rate suddenly spikes on one of your services, you want to, to know about it, you can set an alert for something like that. So that's uh, Grafana, that's the uh, metrics observability that we have. Now what I will do is, oh actually, sorry. I'll just leave that running in the background. So the next thing that we can use to observe what's going on with the service mesh is Kiali, and that gives you a graphical visualization of the services and their interactions. So I'll do, bring Kiali up. Okay, so we can look at graph. I'll choose the book info namespace, and you can see Let's uh, edge labels, we'll do rates per second. Okay, so you can see traffic that's going on there. Let's see if I can zoom into some of these. So the green lines are the ones which are active and the, the numbers on them are the transactions per second uh, at that particular time. So you can see there's quite a lot of uh, work that's going on within uh, the service mesh at the moment, within the book info. So if I go back and kill that generator, then let's change this to five seconds as well. Then you'll start to see those drop off. It'll eventually quiesce because obviously there's no load going into it. Excuse me. So this gives you a quite a good represent, visual representation of what's going on within your service mesh. It gives you a much better understanding. Instead of having, like in this instance, it's only, what have we got, one, two, three, four, five, six services running, but it could be like, 1,000 services, it could be 10,000 services. So this gives you a much easier way of seeing where the traffic is and seeing uh, which parts of your uh, service mesh are actually un under load or, or which services are communicating with which other services. Okay, so while that quiesces. So the next thing we'll look at is tracing. And for this, we use Jaeger. So when requests come into this system, uh, we actually give, give it a transaction ID. Uh, when, it, when it comes in, if it doesn't have one. And from that point onwards, that transaction ID is propagated through each of the service invocations. So we can link invocation, that invocation in one service with whatever it does in the other services as well. So you can get a, a complete graph of how that particular request has gone through your system. So again, so if we take a look at Jaeger, Okay, so yeah, we'll do ingress quickly. Okay, so we can look at uh, the spans. Let's see, I'll tell you what, let's do this one because this one's taking quite a bit of time. So you get a graphical representation of the, of the, the call graph. So uh, this, if we, 
So here, this is the ingress gateway. So when the request is coming into the system, it's, the first stop is the ingress gateway. That's, it, that's its entry into the service mesh. And then from that point on, everything else is within the service mesh. So we've got a, a gateway set up there, which invokes product page. And then product page itself, we'll call book info here. So this is the, the client side in product page, and this is the server side in the details. Sorry, not book info, I meant details. And then again, we've got a client side in product page, which is a, calling reviews, and then this is the server side of reviews. Okay, so you can, you can see how the calls are going through the different system. You can see how long it takes. If, if there's one in particular that you want to look at, you can drill into it, and the information that gets uh, captured by the proxy, the metadata that's captured by the proxy and sent to Jaeger, you have that information there. So you can take a look at it and you can see if there's something peculiar there, something that you can, if there are particular issues that you've identified with something that's taking too long, then you can uh, use that and try and replicate it and try and track it through other logs and, and the like. Okay? So you have those, that information on your requests uh, as well. So that's Jaeger and how it is used. Okay, so those, that's the, yes, kind of your observability part. Grafana, Kiali, and Jaeger, and they, they all have, they all target different areas. So the next thing I wanna show you is traffic control. Uh, so if you're doing, uh, one of the examples that you can do is canary deployment, you can choose to, if you want to deploy a new version of a uh, service into uh, production, but you don't want normal traffic to hit it, then what you can actually do is you can set up a rule so only specific traffic can hit it, and that will allow you, for example, in, in this example, if you're, you happen to be somebody who works in the office from Boston, then you get to see the new version, you get version three. If you're everyone else, then you get to see version two. Okay, so all your usual traffic, most of your usual traffic will hit V2, it's only specific people that will get to, to hit V3. So we can do something like that very easy. And bear in mind, when I'm making these changes, I'm not touching the running services. They're all running. These are all declarative changes. So what we're going to do here, and the bit that's important, is that part here. So the, the first part says, if we have a request that comes in and it has the end user header as Kevin, no guess, no, you don't need to guess why I chose that name. Uh, then it will go to V3, and if you have anybody else, it goes to V2. Okay, so we can look at, one thing I haven't shown you so far. Oh, that's not the one I want. Uh, okay, so if we look at book info, then you can see on the right-hand side, that at the moment, with no rules there, we are circling through three different backends for reviews. Okay, so version one is that one with no stars. Version two is that one with black. And if we get a red one, that one's version three. Okay, so if we were to just create those rules within Istio, then we're now stuck on version two because we said that uh, all traffic apart from Kevin should go to, to version two. So if I log in as Kevin, okay, I get red, which is version three. If I sign out, we're back to black. If I sign in as, oh, say, Bob, then we're still on black. So it's only when I sign in as Kevin that we, we get to shift to uh, V3. So again, that's declarative. There's no changes to the application in order to do that. It's all handled by the proxy and at the infrastructure level. Okay. So that's the canary. You can do that with canary. Uh, weighted router, you can do the same thing if you want just to test a new version of an application or you, uh, you want to test uh, either, either performance or behavior, whatever it happens to be, you can set, uh, specify a certain percentage of traffic to go to the application. So we'll do that. Uh, with uh, Istio here. Uh, so again, it's just a matter of specifying the rules. We've got two destinations there, V1 and V2, and they have weightings. Uh, V1 is 95%, V2 is 5%. So let's create that, and I'll put some load on the system so we can see something going through. 
And if we go back to Kiali, oops. Okay, let me change this so it's percentage. Okay, so we then get to see. I don't want to do that. Let's see if we can do it this way. Right, so you've got V1 is receiving roughly 95%. I mean, it's not accurate. It's, it's a close approximation. And V2 is receiving 6% of the traffic. Okay, and then that changes 94 and is it getting even closer? But it, it, it fluctuates. It's not guaranteed to be always 95% on the dot or, or 5%. So that allows you uh, to send your traffic to uh, different versions of a service based on a particular weighting. So you can look to see how V2 performs versus V1. If it doesn't matter whether it's a functional change or a performance change or whatever it is that you want to, to test, that gives you the ability to do that. Okay, so let's... So let's pull those down. Okay, so that's weighted, weighted routing with Istio. Uh, Dart launches with Istio. Uh, so this is when you want to put a new application into production. You want to test it with production traffic, but you don't actually want to release it into production yet. So you want it to get traffic from the original uh, production system, uh, handle it as if it was a request coming in from your, your clients, but then you don't respond to it. So. What happens here is Envoy will duplicate the traffic from, so service A Envoy there, will duplicate the traffic from uh, A to, to B V1 and send it also to B V2, but it will just ignore any responses that it gets. So it just sends it and forgets. Okay, that's what that does. So if we... So again, the configuration is, is pretty simple. You have your normal destination there, which is V2 of reviews, and all you're saying is mirror the traffic, in this case, to, to V3. So if we were to put that into, well, actually, I'll tell you what. Uh, let, me, let me deploy it without the mirroring first. And I'll show you what that looks like. And then we'll go to Kiali again. Okay, we should be seeing some load there. Come on, Kiali. Ah, there we go. Okay. So now we are seeing traffic coming in. Now at the moment, you can see we've got a green path which is coming in here. It's going to V2 and straight to ratings. There's no traffic at all V3, okay? So if we change the mirroring, I'll just keep that going in the background, and add the mirroring, then okay, hopefully this will start to become clear. So what will happen is that the a proxy for V1 will start sending traffic to V3 as well. Now, you won't see it as a client invocation, but you will start to see V3 creating traffic as a result of that. So there we go. We've got V3 now creating traffic. So this line here is still gray. It's not showing up within the transaction, but we now have another transaction being created here, which is the mirror traffic and everything that the V3 is doing on behalf of the mirror. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I've never actually seen that happen before. <laughs> and I only, I only updated to Kiali the, the, the latest version the other day as well. So, oh, no. All right. Okay, demo gods are not shining. Uh, all right, let me see if I can... Let's see what happens if we start again. There we go. Oh, oh no, my demos have gone. Ay, 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 ay. Okay. <coughs> Ah, there we go. We're back. Uh, 
Okay. I've killed all that. Five seconds. Okay, so we're back. I'm sorry, I don't know what that was. I, I'll check the logs later on, see if there's anything in the logs to feed it back to the Kiali team. Okay, so that's mirroring. Uh, that uh, lets you know, that shows you how to do that. Okay. Uh, security, TLS, uh, at the moment, none of the traffic there is being encrypted. So if we go back to here, so what we have is a product page here. We're currently accessing that through Ingress Gateway. So the request is coming in through HAProxy, which is the, uh, the ingress into OpenShift. That's invoking Ingress Gateway, which is then the ingress into the service mesh itself. So from that point on, if you had, uh, if you enabled MTLS, then all that traffic would be encrypted, okay? But with OpenShift, we can actually bypass Ingress Proxy and go straight to the service. That's not something that we suggest you do as part of the service mesh, but I'll show you it for one particular reason, because when I enable MTLS, you'll then see that any requests that are coming in through that route stop working. Okay, because they're not being, you're not a client which is running within the context of a service mesh, so you have no identity as far as uh, Istio is concerned, and no, certainly no, uh, no, no key for proving your identity with MTLS. Okay, but if we were to, so we've got the app that's running at the moment. Now let me, so if I was to, Okay. So this this is a this is bypassing Ingress Proxy. So this is going into HA Proxy at the front end for uh, OpenShift, bypassing sorry not Ingress Proxy uh, Ingress Gateway. So it bypasses the gateway and goes straight to the service, which represents the the service mesh. Okay. So you're coming in as an external client to the service mesh. If you don't have MTLS, then anybody can do that, anybody can access your service. But if we turn on MTLS, okay, so we set it up here, uh, that product page, uh, we set some rules here that uh, everything which is going on within the uh, book info namespace is, uh, has mutual TLS set up, and where's the other one? And the default policy is MTLS, okay? So anything within the service mesh will be able to talk to your service. So this will still work, because this is the one that's going in through Ingress Gateway, which is the uh, correct ingress for the service mesh. And this one stops working, because now the, the far end of the service is saying, I need MTLS, you need to prove to me who you are, I don't know who you, who you are, because you're not starting a TLS connection with me, because you're not giving me the right credentials, it drops the connection, okay? So that's what MTLS does. It not only encrypts the traffic on the network, but it also enforces identity as well and enforces that you're getting requests that are coming in from uh, somebody within the service mesh. And you can take advantage of uh, RBAC as well so that you can actually specifically say only certain identities within the service mesh can access your service as well. So if you've got A, B, and C within the service mesh, then you can say C can only be invoked from B. You shouldn't allow A to get there. So that means if, if service A becomes compromised, it doesn't have access to the rest of your applications. Okay? So I'm just gonna, uh, actually I'll just bring it down. just bring that down in the background, because that was actually the last of my, my demos. That was as far as I got. So fault tolerant aspects. Uh, circuit breakers, we already talked about circuit breakers before. The purpose of those are really to handle services that are repeatedly failing, okay? You don't want to keep sending your requests to those services because you suspect there's a problem with them. So you, you would say, thanks. So you would say, uh, <laughs> sorry. So you would say, for example, okay, well, if I get uh, 20 errors within a certain period, then that means that I no longer trust this service, so I want the circuit, circuit breaker to trigger. At that point, the Envoy proxy from the client side will just not send a request to the server. It will just return an error. And your application can then handle that and recover from that as it sees fit. 
Okay, so in this instance, if service C was to become heavily loaded, then you, you, you can trigger your circuit breakers for uh, B to C and A to C as well. So they would no longer invoke that service, or no, leave, no longer attempt to invoke that service. Uh, timeouts and retries, again, that, that's something that you can specify declaratively. You can specify timeouts on your uh, invocations. You can specify a number of retries before you give up and re return an error to the client. And Envoy, Envoy again, will will handle that on your behalf. It's not something your application needs to know about. Rate limiting, similar. Maximum number of connections, maximum concurrent requests that are going to a service. Again, you can specify that and it'll choke the number of requests that are going into a service so you don't overload it. Chaos engineering, injecting faults. Uh, you can inject a 10 second delay for operations. So you can say, in this example here, we have 10% uh, of requests that are going from B to C. You should add in a 10 second delay. Okay, so that will test how service B will tolerate long operations, long requests. Does it handle a request that takes 10 seconds? Is it, does it fall over? Okay, you know now rather than when you're in production when it happens for real. Uh, similar, you can do HTTP uh, status code responses as well. So rather than everything being rosy and you get your 200 back with your response, throw in a 400 or something else and see how your application handles it. And again, this is declarative. You choose when to do it. You choose the percentage of requests that you can do it with. It gives you a, an opportunity to force your application to fail and just see how it tolerates failures. Okay. So that's, those are the, the kind of areas that I was going to cover. There, there is a lot more. But we didn't do policy or anything like that because that's much more involved usually. Uh, especially uh, we integrate with Freescale, which is an API management uh, system as of the sprint. We've got that integration in there and you've got the usual RBAC stuff in there as well. So I haven't covered any of that, but I'll just take a second to tell you about uh, service mesh. So OpenShift service mesh, that's our distribution of Istio. We take the upstream Istio and we create CentOS versions of it, RHEL versions for it, and it's intended to go into OpenShift uh, eventually. We're about to GA uh, now, with all the delays from uh, things like OpenShift and the upstream Istio, we'll be delaying, we'll be GAing uh, roughly the end of April with our uh, intended GA. And that includes Jaeger, Kiali, Prometheus, Grafana as well. Maestro is the upstream name. Everything's open source. That's where we, we have it. Uh, we integrate with the applic uh, ROAR application runtimes. So whether that is uh, Spring Boot, or Vertex, or Node.js, or uh, I'm trying to think what the new, Thorntail. sorry? Thorntail. Thorntail, thank you very much. I was trying to remember what the new name for that was. Uh, then we integrate with those as well. So they've got uh, demos that show those languages being used within Istio. And we integrate with Freescale for API management uh, as well. So you can include integration of Freescale through Mixer. Uh, so you can specify policies that can be enforced uh, in, in the three scale system and have it enforced in, in Istio as well. So the other thing is, I don't know if anybody's looking for a job, but we're actually hiring. <laughs> so we have two recs open this quarter and I've got another rec next quarter and I'm trying to build up the team as quickly as possible. So seriously, if anybody is interested in working on this, then let me know and uh, we'll get you to apply. Okay, resources. Uh, these are good books. Uh, Christian Poster, Burr Sutter have done these. Uh, Clément has done the one on reactive microservices with Java. Uh, the, the one on the right, Istio in Action, is currently in the early access program. You can get hold of it as Christian writes it. He's fair way through, but he's still got a way to go. Uh, but it's definitely worth pursuing. Uh, Christian no longer works for Red Hat, unfortunately. He went to, to work for somebody else recently, took out another opportunity, but he's been an absolutely fabulous help for my team. Very experienced with Istio, he knows a lot of stuff. He's definitely somebody to pay attention to. There are some labs that we have as well that you can run through. Uh, so learn to openshift.com forward slash service mesh, service mesh, or you can go to bitly.istio-tutorial and you can run through those labs as well. So uh, there are PDFs of these slides available, which I think will should be on the conference web website or something. So if I'm not giving you enough time to take photo, I just saw some people taking photographs, but you should be able to get it from the slides as well. 
Uh, and that's it. So questions. I think we've got five minutes left for questions. Okay. You mentioned layer seven protocols being added to the Envoy proxy, and uh, Kafka was one of the protocols. Are there more coming? Like. Uh, uh, so the, the, the question was, I mentioned layer seven protocols being added to Envoy proxy and mentioned specifically Kafka earlier on. Uh, there are more that have been suggested, but as with uh, anything open source, it's a community project. So people have to, uh, somebody needs to step up and do it. The Kafka work is already underway. Uh, that's been going for a while. It is something that we are also interested in from our side. So that's something, if it's still a work, it's still work which is outstanding, and we already have people working in Envoy to do uh, open SSL support for Envoy as well as the incremental XDS. And then we'll move them over and they can look at doing Kafka and stuff like that as well. So Kafka is definitely underway. It's a work in progress. There's PR uh, there already for it. And, uh, but it's tagged as WIP, so it's not something they would merge. But it's, it's, it's in development. So it's, it's quite far along the path to, to getting there. I'm not, not aware of any others, but I mean, it's, it's open source. So if there's anything you need, put in a, create an, a, a, an issue in GitHub for Envoy Proxy, and then somebody will look at it. OK, any other questions? Yes? What should we expect in the next month? What can we see on roadmap? And so the question was, what should we expect in the next month? Where can we see a roadmap? Uh, so my question back to you is, are you talking about community, or are you talking about products, or what roadmap are you thinking about? Okay, so uh, OpenShift side, we are GAing as a product towards the end of April. So OpenShift 4 has uh, slipped, it's now I think mid-April, and we are I think a week or a week and a half behind them, so it gives us time to test it. Just do last minute testing to make sure uh, we're ready before we release. As far as community is concerned, so that, that is going to be based on Istio 1.1, which is still being worked on in the community. Our tech preview images are already using uh, the release 1.1 branch as of about a week ago. Uh, I think it was last Friday, so just a week back yesterday, eight days ago, uh, where we took the snapshot to, to, uh, to productize. So that will be, those tech preview ones will be released on Wednesday, this Wednesday, and that includes the three scale stuff. So you can get that, you can play around with, with that now, uh, either rel-based or CentOS-based. We do community ones and we do product ones through the, the uh, OpenShift registry. Uh, <coughs> release 1.1 one, one for upstream Istio, in theory, is going to be, uh, I think it's February 21st is the date for it, but there are still quite a few P0s that are open that we need to get rid of first. So it's, there is a possibility that we'll Either, either they're all going to get fixed in the next week and everything's going to be fantastic, we're going to be on track, or it's going to slip again. Uh, but it's, it's not too far away from it now. So our GA will be based on Istio 1.1, and we're currently looking at towards the end of April. Okay, any other questions? <laughs> I don't know why your hand went up slowly there. <laughs> Knative is based on top of Istio. So they take our stuff and they add their, the serverless stuff on top of that. So is it all the same Istio? So it's yes. parts of which are running Knative stuff and parts of my cluster running other applications, it's always the same Istio? Yes, side. yes. So they, they take the images that we create for Istio and they base their, they just add in the serverless stuff on top of that. So we are, we are underpinning uh, K-native. Okay, any, yep. So do I still need, say the need of? For example, for security, for security, do you need a WAF? Do you still see the need to have a WAF? A WAF? I'm not, I don't understand. A web application firewall. Uh, so yes, I, I wouldn't say don't do it, because I think more security is good security. Uh, it, you, you have different, <laughs> security is one of those things where you get different vulnerabilities in different areas, and it's better to be protecting it in depth than relying on 
one particular thing. So there are certain things that Istio does really well for security. So mutual TLS, that kind of stuff, the role-based access control so you can restrict who can focus on it, but it's not protecting the applications themselves. So anything which can reduce the impact of vulnerabilities in your application, you should still do. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Uh, I think that's done, so thank you very much for your time.